I think we should get started. Uh, welcome again, everyone. Such a joy and pleasure to have you all here to be in conversation with our panelists. Again, my name is Pearl Batnagar. I am the National Coordinator, National Organizer for Freedom Cities. Um, I am joined by a number of groups, which I'm excited to, to introduce in just a second. Um, before, uh, before that, I'm just gonna go into some quick housekeeping. Um, I wanted to share some announcements we will be taking live notes and someone from my team will uh, drop a link into the chat so you can follow along with the conversation as is helpful to you. Uh, second thing is that we are accepting donations uh, that will go towards making this series possible in the future and will also go towards um, honoring our speakers for the time that they have with us and any artists that join us in um, illustrating um, what they see come out of this webinar too. So please, if you can, if you're able, um, share some of, some of that love our way. Um, third, if you, if you hear something, um, something that calls you on this webinar, we encourage you to tweet uh, with the hashtag just transition or hashtag freedom cities, that's freedom cities plural. Um, if there's any uh, kernels of, of, of knowledge or nuggets that are exciting, we wanna get this information as uh, broadly out there as we can. And thank you for your support in doing that. Um, the last piece is that we will be recording this conversation and we usually put it up on YouTube later. So just uh, to be mindful of, um, as there will be an ask for some audience participation later. Um, I also wanna name that due to illness, uh, Deirdre, who was one of our panelists is unable to join us. And I just wanna send a lot of love and healing her way. And if you could do the same, I think, um, it'd be really appreciated. And uh, we are excited to emerge into this version of the conversation and look forward to being in continued conversation with Deirdre um, at a different time. All right, y'all. So uh, this is the webinar on land, abolition, and just transition. And it's the fourth in a series of conversations that we've had on visioning transformative futures, right? Where we get to flex our radical muscles of imagination, to think about a world without police and prisons and also get into conversation with practitioners who are creating a new status quo in real time. And the folks that I was so eager to introduce earlier um, are the folks that you see um, on the screen and some folks that um, you may not see who are behind the scenes in different ways um, that have come together through a partnership between the Freedom Cities Network and the Reinvest in Our Power uh, Network as well. And so, I'll just name some of the orgs a part of each group. Uh, maybe you recognize them. Maybe you're like, yeah, that's my squad. Uh, so Freedom Cities includes Freedom to Thrive, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, the Ella Baker Center, Million Hoodies for Justice, Policy Link, and the Center for Community Change. Uh, Reinvest in Our Power includes the New Economy Coalition, the Climate Justice Alliance, and uh, Movement Generation. And so clearly there were so many hands involved in making this call possible and so many different frameworks that were exchanged in the process of, of getting here uh, that I wanna honor um, and that you will experience through our conversation. Um, and the purpose of, of these two networks coming together is to really create room for reflection and imagination. Uh, we know that we often say uh, no to what we don't want, right? The policies, institutions, systems that are harming our communities. Uh, we, we are very versed in what we want to divest from um, and are forced into a defensive place oftentimes. But that also means that um, we don't get the time or we don't carve the time to uh, move into our excited, pleasurable yes. Um, something that Audre Lorde has said and Adrian Marie Brown reminds us of is that we often fear these yeses, these yeses of what it is that we want to build, um, what our North Stars are, what our dreams look like. And so as we uh, take the time today to imagine big, we also wanna dig into the how. So what are the strategies and tools that are available to us to build the things that we need to survive, right? Um, what are the practical initiatives that folks are on the ground are making happen in real time, getting in right relationship with each other um, and with themselves to organize towards uh, what we're calling a just, just transition towards ecological, economic and social justice. Um, and I also want to name that over the last half of this year, we've really walked on a path to get to this point of this fourth webinar. I don't think I'm the same person I was when we first had a call in January. Um, 
And it's been exciting to see the growth in my colleagues, comrades, peers, and mentors as well. Um, so I just want to recognize the work that's, that's happened over the course of, of, of this last half of a year to get to this point. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, and I'll just do a quick recap for those who um, didn't, weren't able to make it at the time, but maybe want to tune in now. We can have our, our colleagues send um, little links to the videos in the chat if folks are interested. So for our first call we had uh, with Adrienne Marie Brown, uh, we learned that organizing is like science fiction. Again, that we need to say um, a big yes to the world that we want to live in and cannot be afraid of um, imagining bigger and being um, science fiction authors, right? Um, in every moment that we do our work. From Mariam Kaba, Mia Mingus, Nathan Shara, and Zochiel Bavera, we learned that there's no one handbook to transformative justice. But there are as many ways to solve violence as there are people um, who need to be in right relationship and that um, getting in that right relationship is the key to creating change and liberated systems um, to address harm. Um, and then our last convo was with Mia Evans, Najari Smith, and Doria Robinson, where we learned that cooperative economics means flexing our muscles towards human reconnection and building a wider and more connected we. And all of those, uh, all of those intentions, all of the ideas that were shared get us to this moment where we're bridging a conversation that brings the concept of land to this question of what does it mean to, to, to build out a world without police and prisons. And as we ask this question, um, we want to acknowledge that land has been a crucial strategy for communities for millennia, and also that we're all in the process of unlearning and relearning what those strategies mean and look like. So I'm just going to share that I'm um, in the process of practicing feminism by naming that even in the preparation for this webinar um, in the conversations I've had with Karina and Deirdre and Ed, um, I've learned so much about how mired our vocabulary is in dominant capitalist terms um, and that I ask for um, the grace in real time to move through figuring out um, what the best vocabulary is to use, how to best speak to um, some of these concepts with the positionality that I hold. And I hope that um, we all work together in figuring out what this looks like to build out a new world in which um, the terms that we use reflect the actions that we want to take as well. So um, thank you for that co-learning, um, co-learning in real time in front of hundreds of people. Um, and then last, what I want to offer before I hand it over to Ed to take us into this theoretical historical underpinning of the connection between land abolition and indigenous sovereignty is um, why the organizers wanted to have this call. And some of the concepts that have come up for us um, is this idea that scarcity leads to violence, right? That um, we want to be abundant about the flow of resources um, that are coming into our communities, but in the current systems of exploitation uh, where our labor is being stolen from us, we, we don't live in a system where we believe that uh, what we need is abundant and that the earth will provide. And so when there is profiteering off of black and brown bodies that is inherent to an extractive economy, this leads to a scarcity mindset and this leads to violence, right? Um, so as long as we are dependent on an extractive system to meet our needs, then we will be dependent on the use of violence to uphold that system. Um, and so we're excited about opening up to uh, new clear pathways for safety um, and safety and meeting the needs of our people being interdependent and important towards healing our connection to each other and ourselves. Yeah, okay. And so with that, um, I, it's a deep honor to pass it on to Ed Whitfield. Um, Ed Whitfield is the, uh, was with the Fund for Democratic Communities. He's on the board of the New Economy Coalition and is part of the Black Land and Power Alliance and much, much, much more. Um, and so with all of that, Ed, would you take it away and offer some of your framings as we better understand the connection between land abolition and just transition? I should unmute, that helps. Um, First of all, I'm really glad to be here. I'm kind of honored to be a part of this discussion. I see a lot of old friends and some uh, what I'm sure to be become new friends uh, in the group. I'm looking forward to sharing a few ideas about how we can understand this interrelationship between um, land 
power, liberation, freedom, uh, incarceration, and a number of other things that are that are all connected together. And the way they're connected together is through human life as we understand it on, on Earth. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about land as the basis of revolution. Uh, and in some ways it is, and in many times prior to now, it has seemed even more so than, than it is right now because things are slightly complicated, but they've always been this way. Um, land is foundational. It's the foundation of everything. We stand on it. We, we eat food that grows on it. We, some of us eat animals that run around on it. And, uh, but water is life, which is something that we have certainly heard a lot of lately from our friends in the indigenous community as they protested certain attacks on water that they recognize to be a tax on life itself. And air is absolutely essential. And quite frankly, if people could commodify and sell you air, there are certain people who would be doing that too, much like they're selling land. So land, water, and air are the essentials, uh, essential parts of nature, which along with that, that life that has emerged here on the earth, you know, is part of what it is that that humans came to find. It was the pre-existence of, of, of land, water, air, and life that led to the possibility of people living, becoming themselves productive. So before we made things on, on our own, uh, we had these things that we just found. They were there already. Nobody can take credit for them. They ought to belong to us all. Instead, we know for a fact, though, that almost every square inch of land on Earth has been claimed by someone as something that they own. And now it is increasing smaller and smaller people that is holding on to that enclosure as a source of their own power. Um, so, but once humans emerged on this place where we were given access to land, water, and air, we became productive in a way that we found that we could make other things. We could take the earth itself and shape it into clay pots and fire them and have things, vessels to drink more easily out of. We could take, you know, the, the soil and the grass and shape it into bricks and build structures to live in. We could, we could find metals in the earth and work them into tools that we could use to chisel out stones to build cathedrals. We found precious metals in which we could make beautiful jewelry. We found ways to smooth out the earth and make roads and connect between one place and another. We found a way to go from rolling logs to making wheels and axles that allowed us to have wheels so we could have transportation and roads to pull them on. We found ways to get rid of our human waste and we built waste disposal systems. We built water supply systems. We built up an infrastructure of roads, uh, buildings, uh, and things that we could utilize to enhance the quality of life. But it all began with our access to the earth itself, the water on the earth and the air that surrounds it. Um, and I say that because it was, the, it was the earth along with labor that allowed us to produce everything else. And I, I mean that quite literally everything else. And everything else therefore is a product, is a social product of human activity given the existence of the earth and the land. So, so take something like capital. People talk about the factors of production are uh, land, labor, and capital. And yeah, except two of them are different from the other. That land and labor are sacred. Capital is a tool. It's instrumental. It's among the things that we made at some point in time in order to serve a purpose. We invented money. We created that. Uh, it was a tool. We invented markets. We created them. They were a tool. Market is a tool that helps you connect somebody who's produced something in one place to somebody who needs something who might be in a different place and they meet together in the marketplace and they have this exchange. And it's a wonderful way for getting shoes and potatoes. It's a terrible way for allocating health care and justice. So, um, so markets, you know, have a role that they play. Money has a role that it plays. Capital has a role that it plays. But all of these are the tools. They are, they are instrumental tools that eat, need to be utilized to meet human needs and elevate the quality of life. And instead, unfortunately, we live in a world where people worship the tools and they use what ought to be sacred as instrumental to be used up for the purpose of enhancing the tools. 
So that which is sacred, which is the earth and human life and labor on it, is used up in the process of enhancing capital and enhancing and glorifying markets? That's crazy. And whatever label you put in front of it, you can put black, green, yellow, red in front of it, it still is an insane kind of system that doesn't make any sense and it is highly inhumane and immoral and leads to the world that we have today where so many tragic things take place. When people have opportunities to be productive, which is they have access to the, to the land, the earth, and they have access to the built wealth that has been created by human social activity on the land and the earth, then people tend to be productive and produce for themselves the things that they need that enhance their life and meet their needs. When people don't have access to opportunities to be productive, they engage in whatever activities that they might be able to engage in for survival kinds of purposes. And so for this reason, out of a failure of the society to create a humane world in which people are, are widely able to meet their own needs and elevate the quality of life, out of the failure of that system, we find a way to, to identify certain people as misfits and to squirrel them away, lock them away, out of sight, out of mind, uh, so that they don't harm other people. And this is the prison system we had. And somebody's figured out how to make money off of that. <laughs> so that that this, this commodification of everything has take, takes place in the kind of world we live in. Where, think of America. Think of the American story, the exceptional story that America tells around the world, uh, talking, calling itself uh, a, parad a paragon of liberty and virtue. And it is indeed exceptionalism, and I will call it the special form of American exceptionalism, that a country that was founded in genocide land theft and slavery now tries to pass itself off around the world as a paragon of virtue. That is indeed exceptional. And if you want to celebrate something, celebrate that. How in the world do we get a chance to, to claim all this stuff? And I'm reading recently that, uh, suppose there's this investigation that's been done about the Russian collusion with the last election, that it decided that it is Russians who are stirring up racial discord in America as though, as though the agents of capitalism and racism haven't done a fine job of stirring up racial discord for years and years and years without the help of Russians. But anyhow, that's the world we live in. Uh, these economic realities shape the conditions that give rise to the prison system, but they also shape the conditions that give rise to the freedom struggle. And so a big part of what we have to do is figure out how, how do we define, how do we understand and how are we going to become free in a world so that we open up again the commons? We open up our common access to land and labor and the built wealth for all of the people so that those people from whom the land is stolen, those communities for which absolute destruction was, was, was ordained and planned that has just refused to go away. So I just came, just last thing I want to say, and I'm about out of time in 10 minutes. I just came back from Boley, Oklahoma, which is a town in Oklahoma that at one time was the wealthiest uh, and most prominent black city in the country. And it was made up of a combination of black and Creek Indians who were in, um, in Oklahoma at the time. And they built this community even before Oklahoma became, became a state. And this was the community, at some point you should read about it, you will be highly amused to realize that this is where Pretty Boy Floyd's gang met its end because the black folk who owned their bank there that had their money in it that was being used for their community to build and develop itself did not want their bank robbed by Pretty Boy Floyd. So there are things that we have done together in this country, uh, again, that was rooted in this country whose founding was rooted in genocide, land theft, murder, enslavement, rape. Um, and we have to again find ways to work together as we recreate those commons that commonly accessible wealth that allows us all to be fully productive, to meet our needs and elevate the quality of life in our communities. That's it. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you for offering a framing that will then um, support us in understanding better and more the work that um, Karina and you are doing through the Sororite Land Trust and the Black Land and Power Network. And so with that, um, I would love to move to Karina next. 
um, and as, as, we, as we go through some of these specific initiatives that folks um, are co-creating with their communities, uh, encourage you all to check out the notes, go back to some of these really important pieces that Ed has shared around the connection between land, power, liberation, freedom, uh, water, air, uh, all the things that allow us to, to create and build and make together. And so with that, Karina, Karina Gold, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the Sergorite Land Trust, would love to have you um, talk to us about what it is that y'all are building. I believe you're on mute, Karina. Hello? Can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ed. That was wonderful. I look forward to having more conversations with you when we have time together to chat. I want to thank everybody for inviting me to be a part of this webinar today. And I think it's um, important for us to talk about um, how we are living on stolen land. Uh, what we now, what we call Turtle Island, what is now known as the United States, uh, can live together um, in ways that are going backwards. And that's what I kind of think about when we talk about rematriating the land. We talk about how do we figure out a way to sustain ourselves, um, bringing back our traditional methods of, uh, of getting food, of medicine, of our uh, ceremonial ways. And, and I think that the land trust does a lot of that. Um, you wanna pull up the, have some slides. Suki, were you gonna do those? Not my slide, but that's okay. <laughs> Can you see them now? Yeah, that's not my slide. I don't know who's what this <laughs> is. <laughs> let me let me um, fix that. That's okay. Um, so I guess I just wanted to talk about the Segurate Land Trust came out of a movement of working um, in the Bay Area. So this is the traditional territory of Ohlone people. Ohlone people are actually eight different nations of people with eight different languages and eight different creation stories. And everybody thinks that we're the same because upon colonization, Spaniards called us Costa Noan, the people from the coast, um, and, um, and then didn't realize that there were so many of us that um, had different um, stories about where we came from. And so, as we begin to look at this whole idea of decolonization, <clears throat> we are also beginning to take back our own languages and our own songs, our own ceremonies and the way we, we call ourselves. And so I'm actually from the Lashon people. Uh, that's what our, we say in our language and that are the East Bay Ohlone people. Um, and we speak the Chochenyo language and during the last 20 plus years of our of my life, we've been doing a lot of work around protecting and preserving the sacred sites of my ancestors. And, you know, we talk about uh, a lot of different things that are happening in the world. Um, but when we talk about land, we have to know that we're talking about the sacred. And when we're talking about ancestral burials, we're talking about how we are connected specifically to land and space and place. And so as indigenous people, our spirituality cannot be moved around. And I talk about this a lot when we, when we look at um, doing interfaith work together with other folks that, um, you know, there's ways that people can take their religion uh, to different places in the world. And when it comes to indigenous people, we are actually tied to space and place. Um, and some of the work that I've been doing recently in the Bay Area, the protection of the West Berkeley Shell Mound, um, and the bringing up of, of these different places um, have to do with protecting the land, but also when we talk about doing the protection of the land, it also means protecting all of those that now live in our territory as well. This is Janella LaRose, and she has been my partner in crime with Indian People Organizing for Change and now with the Segurite Land Trust. And we have been working together to bring about awareness of uh, our sacred sites in the Bay Area for the last 20 years. We did a walk in the Bay Area from 2005 to 2008 that walked the different shell mounds. Shell mounds are the burial sites of the Ohlone people that are, have been destroyed because of development in our territory. We've been totally um, erased by the uh, building up of our lands and what is now the San Francisco Bay Area. 
um, after taking over some land in 2011, one of our sacred sites in Vallejo, uh, one of the things that we realized or that we didn't have was how are we going to bring these ancestors, thousands of them that are at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State and all of the different institutions in the Bay Area that have been mined by archaeologists and anthropologists over the years, taking apart our cemeteries. How are we going to get these ancestors back into the land? And how are we going to bring people back to the land for a healing play project? We did the walks to all of these sacred sites, the 425 shell mounds um, in the Bay Area, starting in Vallejo, walking down to San Jose and up to San Francisco. We did that for four years with people from all over the world doing this work. In 2011, we helped to take over a sacred site in Vallejo called Segorite. It was the, one of the last holding sites for my ancestors, the last uh, strongholds before they were taken into the mission systems. And it's on the last 13 acres of open land on the Cartagena Strait. And um, after that, uh, that spiritual takeover of that land, we decided that we needed to, that's what we didn't have. As people from our own territory, we are not federally recognized, and so we do not have land base. So we are homeless in our own territories. Even though we have been here since the beginning of time, we don't have a land base. And what does that do to a person's psyche, a whole community's psyche, to be homeless on your own territory? And so we begin to think about how do we create this land healing by bringing people back to the land? Because we realize when we brought people to Segorite when we were holding and, and taking care of that land in Vallejo, that people actually um, came to, from all walks of life, came to figure out what it was like to be human beings again. What it was like to share food and ceremony. What it was like to band together for a purpose. And I think that as human beings, we forget about that. That we forget what it is to connect to the land again in a spiritual way. How do we... How do we connect to each other again as human beings? How do we see each other really again? And so uh, in a few years ago, we decided to create the Segorite Land Trust to bring land back into indigenous stewardship. Um, and more, more than that, to bring land back into indigenous women's leadership. In the Bay Area, we created the first urban Indigenous Women-Led Land Trust in the country in order to do just that. Um, we work with all Indigenous women, so it's not just the Ohlone uh, people, even though it's in my traditional territory, it's important that Indigenous women have come from all over the world to be in our territory. Specific Indigenous women like Jamel and her family came during relocation period um, when the government was forcing Native people out of their traditional homelands and onto into the cities with the promises of education and jobs. And most of that did not happen um, in lots of places. So people were sent to San Francisco and Detroit and Chicago and New York and LA uh, with these promises in order to get indigenous people off of their land so that the United States government could go into those lands and suck and drive resources. Janelle and I uh, created, uh, went up a year ago um, with a bunch of folks and we fell down some redwood trees to create the first um, the first uh, ramp, uh, arbor in our territory that hasn't something that hasn't been here for 250 years uh, so the model that you saw in that first picture was uh, what that was going to look like and so a year ago we went up to um, Sonoma got uh, were able to work with people to thin out a piece of land that they had um, and take down the redwood trees we needed. And we brought together people from all walks of life uh, to, to begin to take those, to skin those uh, redwood trees. And over a process of uh, a year, those redwood trees had been skinned um, and land had been cleared. The first piece of land that we received as uh, the land trust um, is on 105th Avenue in Oakland it's on the two acres of land that Planting Justice has uh, as a garden. And the interesting thing about Planting Justice is that um, they work with folks that are formerly incarcerated and give them good paying jobs. Um, and it's a young, a, a young couple, uh, Gavin and Halei, 
but uh, they and some of the people that work for them went to Standing Rock. And when they went to Standing Rock, and the whole idea was uh, coming uh, to fruition about how people needed to change their lives and how we needed to hold on to one another and to this earth and our, our responsibilities. They talked to the elders of that, uh, of that land there. Then they were leaving. Hey all, I think we're having a technical difficulty. Um, I believe that Karina maybe stepped off, um, hopefully is trying to uh, rejoin the call if there's someone on our team on the admin side that can just check in with Karina. Um, maybe in the meantime, hey Ed, what do you think about what Karina was sharing with us? Um, and also happy to engage in conversation. We have this Brady bunch of a family up here too, um, of our organizers. So if, yeah, if anything called you um, around what Karina was saying, um, encourage you to share until we, we wait for her with patience to come back and join us in conversation again. So um, squad, what are y'all, how are y'all feeling? Oh, she Karina, may be you're back. Hey, Karina, can you hear us or see us? Okay. Cool. I'm going to ask someone from our team to take care of Karina, and maybe uh, the rest of us can, can reflect. Hello? Oh. Hello? Hey, Karina? Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Oh my gosh. My phone, I mean, my computer totally just died and I don't know what happened right in the middle of me oh talking. God. So I'm on the phone. We're patient. Um, we're here. We're waiting. We're ready. <laughs> so <when> sorry. You... <laughs> no, these things happen um, and we're emergent and we're glad you're back. Oh, thank you we so much. We were just going to have a little reflection session on all that you've already shared with us, but now there <laughs> will be more to reflect on. Okay, so I think I was talking about the takeover of the land um, and why we needed to have the uh, Segurite Land Trust. Um, oh, and the, the logs, that's right. So we were taking down the logs. They, so a year ago, we went up and we worked um, and took down 48 of these relatives. And we're called, they're called our relatives because they are our tree people. They have um, been here on this earth longer than us, have seen more than we have, have a whole system of uh, communication through their roots, are able to tell each other about danger and are able to lift up other uh, plant life. And so I think that, that one of the things that we don't think about is that, um, that all of this life around us, that we are just a part of it. Um, we are a very small part of it. And indigenous teachings, it tells us that human beings are, um, we're the pitiful ones. And the reason that we're pitiful is that we need everything on this earth that she has to give us, the water, the air, the land, the trees, the medicines, the foods, the animals. Nothing on this earth needs us in order to survive. And so I, I think when we begin to have that framework in our mind, we're able to see where our place is in this earth. That we um, as indigenous people have to also get in alignment with that again as well. When Hale and uh, uh and I think that's what I was talking about. Helene and Gavin from Planting Justice went to um, to Standing Rock and was at, told the elders or um, told them that they should go home and work with the indigenous peoples on whose land they were on. They took that to heart. And because they had this two acres of land that they were purchasing um, on 105th Avenue, and they were working with a good friend of ours, Diane Williams, uh, 
they asked her if she could contact us and she set up a meeting and it took us a little while to go over there because we were suspicious. And so we didn't know what they wanted to talk to us about. And so when we sat down with them and they said, this is what they had learned and they would like to offer us the quarter acre of land that they were not using um, uh, to bring it back to indigenous stewardship. Um, my mind was blown uh, because this piece of land is about a half a mile from my house, but it is also probably the um, one of the original village sites of the Lashon people along uh, San Leandro Creek, what is our Lashon Creek. And so um, we have been working with people from all walks of life there to help us to tend to the land and to, um, to get these logs ready for, um, to be put up in a ceremonial place. Uh, as a ceremonial place again. Is it their next picture? I don't know how you get to the next picture. Yuki? Ah, oh, there we go. Um, so these are the logs that um, were taken down. We had work days and we had people from all walks of life helping us to take the skins off. We, we thought that we knew something as human beings. We thought we were going to pull down these uh, logs and, and then within a month we'd have it set up and these logs actually kicked our butts and taught us a lot of lessons about patients and about when they wanted to go up and, um, and how it was that we were going to work with them um, to ensure that we had a good place. And I, and since that time, we've met, you know, hundreds of beautiful people from all walks of life that have come and helped us to do this kind of work. Um, you could go on to the next slide. I think I'm running, I'm probably running out of time here anyway. Uh, so the Segorite Land Trust, about right where you see that, uh, where those people are circled up there, this is the Lashon Creek. Um, that is where our arbor is. And actually, uh, at the beginning of this month, we put up the arbor, um, and it's almost complete. So for in 250 years, we have not had that in our territory. And so for us as Ohlone people, um, that means everything. It means the beginning of a healing of the lands and of the people and of the spiritual places that we're supposed to be. And I think it's important because we work on this land. We work on a place of a piece of land in uh, West Oakland that we've renamed Ramai and the uh, African-American community that, uh, that are lived there and have made that their home. We work in Albany. We have a great connection with the Young Black Farmers Association that come and work our land as well as their own in Giltrack. Um, and we work with people that have come out here to, to honor the Ohlone people, but also to um, begin to talk about what rematriation of land means. And I think that it's important that this is an urban Indian women's led land trust, indigenous women led land trust, because as we begin to look as indigenous women, but women that from all walks of life, uh, we've been told that this is the time right now, our time right now is a spiritual time for us to come back in alignment with the Mother Earth, with us to take our rightful place as indigenous women to stop the things that have been happening, the extraction process that has been happening into the, in this world. For hundreds or thousands of years, our brothers have been in charge of land and we understand that what they have done to land by cutting them into pieces, by selling them off, by extracting stuff out of them, they too have done to our women's bodies. They've used us as extraction as well and have sold us and, and uh, parceled us off and have used us also as uh, pieces of property. And so in order to bring all of that back into alignment, it's time for indigenous women to stand up with other women across the world in our rightful place to bring back the balance that we need, not to throw away the men, but to bring our brothers back in balance to stop the extraction processes, to bring people back to ceremony and back to sharing our lives together with food and with ceremony and with laughter. And how do we begin to do that? Because we need to be able to see one another as human beings again, across the table, across ceremony. We need to be able to see one another across saving each other um, from the destruction that's coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. And thank you for reminding us of how our connection to the land also allows us to connect back to spirit, connect back to each other, and connect back to ourselves. 
um, in the process. And I, I want to uplift your bringing in um, our ancestors into conversations that we're having about land um, and the sanctity of it. Um, and how do we continue to um, do so throughout the rest of this conversation and the work um, that will move forward. So I appreciate you um, and what you've shared. And uh, just to name what will happen for the rest of this webinar, um, we just heard from Karina Gold on what's happening um, with the Sangorante Land Trust. And next, we're gonna ask uh, Ed to focus in on the Black Land and Power Network as um, another example of an of initiative of folks coming together in community uh, to build power through uh, land sovereignty. So we'll uh, check in with Ed, and then afterward we'll have Ed and Karina in conversation with one another um, so we can have some back and forth, some, some um, thoughts going, going that way in, in collaboration with them. Um, and then we'll do a short visioning exercise after that. So Ed, will you take it away and share a little bit about the Black Land and Power Alliance? Yes, I will. Um, following the end of uh, the war attempting to preserve Southern slavery, uh, I decided to rename it. Everybody else wants to call it something, but that's what it was. Um, following the, the end of that war, there was a meeting that was held in Savannah, Georgia by William Tecumseh Sherman, who was in charge of the U.S. military uh, and just gotten through with his march to the sea. And 20, um, 20 black ministers from, from the area, some of whom had just been freed by the Union Army as it passed through others who had purchased their, their freedom sometime before. And it, uh, this meeting was, I think, January 15th, 1865 in Savannah. And he asked them, like, what do you all understand the nature of enslavement to have been? And what do you understand the nature of the freedom that is to be given by the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation? And their response was, we understood, we understand enslavement to be when one person takes the coercion, uh, the product of the labor of some other people. And what freedom would be is if we had a way to retain the product of our own labor, the surplus product from our own labor. So basically it was that you all works this all of this time and you use force and coercion and threats of death and beatings and, and rape and misery to work us on the stolen land and you kept everything we produced. All we were allowed was just enough food to eat and have these tattered rags on and sleep in a place where the weather comes through it. We know what the weather is every day because we feel it. You know, we, we're right out there. That's all we got. And you have the entire product of our labor. And we know for a fact today, as we understand the economic history of the United States, that it was the wealth produced by these enslaved people on this stolen land that financial, that financed the industrial revolution for all of you people in Europe were buying stocks in it. And I say that because what they, were, what they responded would be their source of freedom was that in order for us to be productive, we need access to land that we can work for and till ourselves, use it uh, for our livelihood, and also to build up our community. So that was the concern. Um, uh, that was where the, uh, Sherman came up with the idea of taking the 400,000 acres of land they had just seized from the belligerent people in, in rebellion against the U.S. government and turn over this 400,000 acres to the, the enslaved people who had formerly lived there in 40 acres plots. So he wrote this, this uh, order of 40 acres and later people added some mules to it. The, the army had a lot of mules rid of. 40 acres and a mule, and think of it, this was a productive unit. 40 acres and a mule is what it took for you to produce the food that you needed to feed your family and build up your community and have some money left over to buy whatever else you needed for yourself. Some calico cloth so you could make some clothes and some boots and whatever else you wanted. 40 acres and a mule, a productive unit. That's what people can see it as freedom. Following that time period, there was a whole big push among the previously enslaved people in this country to gain access to land as a means of having access to freedom. Land was thought of as freedom. This is what we don't have to beg anybody anymore. There was a similar push by some other people to keep us from having access to land because they realized that a disfranchised landless people 
could be held in, in, in subservience. So if you look at the, the, uh, that incredible statue that's in the center of the reconciliation park, you see at the very bottom levels, layers of it, people uh, marching around and looking like they're, they're, uh, uh, they're getting ready to do work on the land that they wanted to have. There was a period of time, shortly after the Civil War, when Black folk in this country ended up buying, mainly buying, uh, as opposed to having given to them, uh, about 15 million acres of land. The significance of that is that while the government promised 40 acres for folks, they broke that promise within a matter of months. It wasn't a whole year that passed before they rescinded that order. There was an attempt by the uh, US Congress to pass it again. Uh, President Grant uh, vetoed that. Um, Ulysses Grant vetoed it and gave no land. Um, the U.S. Army withdrew its support for reconstruction in 1877 as part of the Compromise. And this long period of people fighting for and buying land through any means that they could ended up going up, up into the early 1900s where we had 15 million acres of land. Since that time, that has been eroded to Black communities only having around 2 or 3 million acres of land. And a consequent lack of independence that would have grown continued access to that land. So what the Black Land and Power Initiative is, is an, an effort to build in a nationwide way a land trust to give uh, Black communities connection to uh, the land that has been stolen. Now, typically, the Black Land and Labor Initiative, which was one of the forming groups that gave leadership to this effort early part of the Black Land and Power, who are building a network and continuing to organize and are seeking and are finding legal assistance and also uh, financial assistance to help in the process of regaining access to the land. One of the things I have stressed is the importance of, of uh, those of us working uh, to regain access to this land, having skin in the game of this particular project. I don't mean in general, because in general, we can claim our skin in the game is 350 years of slavery. So why should we ever do anything else? I just want to make it very, very clear that the people we're seeking financial resources from are not going to be the owners of this project. They're going to be the people assisting in this project. Because just like Black folk who bought their freedom, one of the leading ministers in this group of 20 Black preachers in Savannah, Georgia in 1865 had just purchased his freedom for $1,000. Now, I don't know if you have any idea how challenging it was for him to get together $1,000 in 1865 to buy his freedom. My assumption is that 1865, $1,000 was a whole, 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 whole lot of money. Um, and, and a lot of us think we can't get together $1,000 right now. But he did then in order, because that's what freedom was worth to him. And in a similar kind of way, some of the most significant organizations that have ever been built in the black community in this country were mutual aid organizations that came from a whole lot of people putting in a little bit each and go, that's what this slide is showing now. Now, go back to that little slide. I like this slide too. Uh, that's part of the devastation that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That smoke in the background is the burning to the ground of a, of a very industrious black community. Uh, at some point, hopefully these slides can be distributed and you'll find that the text on them is legible and readable. And you should read about some of the stuff that took place. The little map in the corner is, is up there. But we want to make sure that the kind of mutual aid thinking that goes in people thinking about doing things for themselves is at the root of our continued work to reaccess the land that has been lost to our community so in the years. So I have a proposal that we're working on trying to figure out how to implement, which is around, I think we can find 50,000 people in the country who would pay $20 a month a piece out of take a credit card, a debit card, and put it on file, have them take $20 out every month. We need 50,000 people to do that. And then we would have $1 million a month to use to rebuy land and put it together in a land trust to take it off the speculative market so that then it can make, be made available for people who want to farm, for people who want to build housing, for people who want to build housing cooperatives, for people who want to build cooperative factories, and other kinds of, of uh, democratically owned and democratically controlled economic activities within the community to build that. So with the Black Land and Power Initiative is a group of people nationwide that are working toward building either a single uh, 
gigantic land trust or a network of land trusts with the appropriate level of technical assistance activity in between to build economic activity and economic stuff on land that is rooted in the, in the rebuilding of commons so that we can all participate. And we're talking about and doing this in conjunction with our access and our communication with indigenous communities. Because again, it is not lost upon us that this land uh, was initially stolen. But it's also not lost upon us that our blood has mixed with this soil. Um, our blood has literally been, been plowed into and mixed with and is part of this, this very soil. So that we're talking about not claiming it as our own away from the indigenous communities that once uh, occupied this land, but rather seizing it again as a commons for which those of us who have a common interest in a common humanity of building a, a, a world that is humane and allows people to be fully productive, where prisons are obsolete things of the past and relics of the failure of capitalism, uh, that this is the, the land that we seek to develop and, and build on. Uh, and then that's, that's my 10 minutes again. We have more time to chat um, together. And so thank, thank you for sharing about the Black Land and Power Initiative, this call to um, take our money and move it back into the commons and off the speculative market. I really appreciate getting just a glimpse of all the work that a wide network of folks are doing in conjunction with each other. And so um, as we move towards this next part of our time together, Having y'all in conversation, I think one of the last pieces you mentioned, Ed, is, is uh, the fact that um, we are on indigenous land, the fact that um, black folks have uh, worked this land for centuries. And, and I, I wanna ask you both what the models and examples are of black and indigenous organizers working together towards land sovereignty and the decolonization of land. Did I, did I miss, did we ask that as a direct question to me? To uh, both of you. Oh. Um, well, one thing, I, I want to start out by saying that, uh, you know, I had a discussion with a woman uh, who is an indigenous woman in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who reminded me of the fact that a lot of the early black land ownership that's counted in those figures of the 15 million acres that later became two or three million, um, grew out of land claims because of a relationship between blacks and indigenous people at the time, because there were many indigenous land claims, particularly in the Oklahoma territory and other places. So one time Oklahoma had the largest number of black towns, but they called them black towns and they were often black and indigenous towns, because again, Oklahoma was on, on the, the terminal end of the Trail of Tears. And so a lot of those native people out of Florida, out of South Carolina, out of Georgia, out of North Carolina were walked in a very, very vicious kind of act at gunpoint, essentially, from their homeland and settled and forced into the Oklahoma Territory. And so a lot of them were, quote, given, given land. What does that mean? It stole it first and let people use it a little bit back. But some of them had already developed relationships with Black communities. And it was like that town I was mentioning, Boley, Oklahoma, where Pretty Boy Floyd folk couldn't rob the bank. That was a town that was built by Black and Indigenous folk together. Um, and for a long time, it thrived until the surrounding economy kind of faltered. Yeah, I really appreciate those historical examples and the ways that we can draw on them for the work that we continue to move forward. Um, Karina, I want to hear if you have any thoughts on the same question on models or examples of Black and Indigenous organizers, community members working together. Yeah, you know, I think that that's one of the questions that uh, always, um, I think that we, we need to have more conversation about that together as our communities um, are beginning to do this work. I think in the Bay Area, um, we're lucky that we have this whole mixture of people that are doing great work around land trust and doing stuff around um, gentrification and trying to keep people in homes and, and things. And I think that sometimes our communities miss each other 
um, and are trying to do work together. I think some of the great things that, uh, you know, when I've done work around sacred sites, like at the West Berkeley Shell Mound or the Emeryville Shell Mound, that I've had great support by Black Lives Matters coming out and supporting those events and inviting people to participate in, in those events and doing work that is more um, mainstream um, kind of things to do that. I think that the conversations, the hard conversations about um, this all being on Turtle Island, indigenous lands, and then how do we um, be inclusive in, uh, of bringing other people in? And it's always, I think, the the work of Segorite Land Trust uh, to be we, to be mindful of all of these guests we have on our, our lands, and to have conversations about what does it look like to be a guest on someone else's land, and how do you act? And I think we, um, that. The great idea is that when I talk to a fourth graders about how do you act when you go to somebody's home, and they all have these great answers, you know, they know how to act, you ask for permission, um, you don't break stuff, you do as, you know, you, uh, you wait until you're asked to do something, you don't go into other people's things, you don't take stuff that's not yours, and I was like, well, we all teach our children these ba basic uh, mannerisms of how to be when you're in somebody else's home, but when we look at uh, what is now called the United States, people don't see it as someone else's home. We're invisibilized um, by um, everybody else that's in our territories. And so I think it's important for us to talk about what does relationship building mean when you're in someone else's territory? And you, no matter who you are, you're always in somebody else's territory. And so I think the first thing to do is to find out who those people are and then how do you go to them and ask to work in relationship with them? And even when we're talking about our sisters and brothers that were brought here <coughs> um, forcefully, um, that those relationships still have to be built out with us within our organizations, within our communities, um, to have those conversations and how do we build community together? Um, like Ed was talking about, you know, that was a, a, a community that were built um, back uh, um, a long time ago, but we're talking about currently today, do we have those same kind of communities coming together and doing this important work? I don't see it as much. I think that there's conversations that are, um, that are being brought together, and I think I'd like to have more of those conversations about that, and how do we make sure that we're, our communities come, come together and our communities are able to thrive together? Um, and have a lot of this have a lot of similar um, ideas about where we want to go. I just think that the conversations aren't happening as much as they should. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the reminder that on this path towards uh, this vision of collective liberation that we hold, um, there are so many frequencies to be to be mindful of, so many ways in which um, dominant paradigms around um, who we are and why we're here um, have been exactly that dominant paradigms that capitalism has taught us. And so what does it mean to unlearn those things? Um, also, as we get in deeper relationship with one another and understand the stories and narratives that um, are held by by each of us based on our positions and positionality. So thank you for that call to be in deeper conversation. Um, and I look forward to be to being in deeper conversation with, with y'all um, to begin. I wanted to um, move on to uh, envisioning question, right? Um, in our past conversations, we've talked about how police and prison abolition is, is not just the absence of something, but it's the presence of, of building something else, building something new. Um, it's the world that we build together. And uh, I just wanted to ask, um, more specifically, I think folks have touched on this already, but, but why do you think land is critical to building a world without police and prisons? If we were to ex accept the existing paradigm of land tenure, ownership, and closure, then we would be forever accepting a small group of people controlling access 
to the very means of life. And at the point when somebody controls their access to the means of other people living, it is an extreme form of what it is that, uh, that those 20 ministers were saying to the general, that uh, if you can, by coercion, control my ability to take care of myself, my family, my community, the things I care about, then you're controlling me and I'm not free at all. Um, so when one person takes control of the product of the labor of other people, then that's, that's what it is. And that is rooted in the laws of land tenure that allow the owner of a land to exact rent for the ownership of that land. And you gotta remember that whoever owns any land cannot claim to have made it. They didn't invent it. They've only been able to steward it, shelter it for some period of time. And for many people, the whole notion of land ownership was an alien notion that was brought here with European colonizers. Uh, the idea that there was some deal struck up where somebody actually sold Manhattan Island the $24 worth of beads is kind of an insulting um, miscarriage of what took place. Uh, it's insulting the idea that you think that somebody would have realized that the value of that land, which is historically and symbolically and ceremonially and productively valuable, would be traded for staring at some trinkets. It's like, no, people had land and they were sharing that land to be used as, as they themselves had shared it and people moved around on land, sometimes returning to the same place. Um, that, that's, that's a natural access and use of land. That was an access the way land was utilized in Africa until the uh, King Leopold from, went and declared all of the land that was currently unoccupied to belong to Belgium. Well, a whole lot of land was currently unoccupied because people used the land, they wear it out, they moved to another part of the land, they let the part that they previously wore out regenerate itself, then they move back onto it. This is people moving around on land is the most natural thing that happens uh, for uh, a lot of people in the world. And so unless we change that and reestablish a commons where people have access to, to land as one of the important factors of production, um, along with the built wealth that all, we, we should also have shared access to. But unless we change those things, then we are forever enslaved to the people and by prerogative of their rights of ownership, control how these things can be utilized and consequently control our full lives, which makes us not at all free. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ed, and I'm wondering, Karina, if you want to share your response to the same question, why do you think land is critical to building a world without police and prisons? Karina, uh, you are on mute if you're trying to answer. I think Karina is frozen. Um, so I'm gonna move to the next question, which is, is connected, right? If we know now what the connection between land um, and abolition looks like, I wanna ask next, um, you know, Freedom Cities is this network of organizers who are working to divest from deportation, detention, imprisonment. Um, I'm wondering if there's a call to action um, and Karina's back too. Um, I'm just gonna finish this question and maybe um, Karina can, can fold her answer to both in if that's what calls her. Um, yeah, I was just talking about how Freedom Cities organizers are working to divest from deportation, detention, imprisonment, and reinvest in community wellness, affordable housing, healthcare, um, education. And I'm wondering if you have a call to action for folks, for folks who are on college campuses, folks who are pushing prisons and, and building restorative justice, especially as it relates to um, the concepts and ideas that we were able to unearth today. In other words, Karina, like what, what can we, um, as organizers doing this work, take away from um, some of the lessons that you've shared and that we hope to continue to learn from you all? Karina, you're on mute. She 
still can't hear you. Is it just me? Can can others hear Karina? No. Maybe let's give it a minute for Karina to figure it out because I want to make sure to hear from her. Karina, maybe you want to try without the headphones? There we go. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> Too many things going on here. I think what I wanted to do is I wanted to add on to what Ed was saying about um, uh, private land ownership and we if we look around our urban places right now in the city of Oakland we have like 9,000 people that are living on the streets because they have no access to land they have no way of taking care of themselves um, without it because there's this private land ownership and folks are being uh, pushed out of um, any affordable places to live when we look at how communities have lived in the past, not that far, that, that long ago, um, there was never anything in our territory um, that, was, uh, that was called homelessness. Everyone had a home, a place to live, a place to sustain themselves, enough food here. There was no such thing as hunger. And we're only talking about in the Bay Area 200 years ago that there was access to everyone having a roof over their head and food in their bellies. And so when we look at this Western ideology, are we really looking at progress? Are we looking at maybe having to take ourselves backwards, right? Maybe um, what I talk about a lot is having to go, in order for us to go forward, we have to go back. We have to think about what our um, indigenous people did before in order for those things to work without prisons, with enough food and with enough housing and that we maybe need to think about actually getting smaller rather than to get larger right and so um, breaking up our huge cities into smaller townships so that people have enough and uh, and everything that they need within walking or biking distance that means doctors and education and food and housing is all within smaller areas that we could use and that perhaps we create these this system where there's barter and trade again so that we take out this whole ideology of money right and this trade system where we're able to sustain ourselves in a good way i mean i think that we're looking at places like when cuba um, um was first putting up coming together that even the doctors went out into the fields and helped when it was time for them to do harvesting, right? That everybody has this equal setting of what they're supposed to do in order to make the community work. And today we don't have that. Today we have, for whatever reason, we are all human beings in the same kind of, uh, on this planet, but we find that we're able to look, turn a blind eye to people that are living on the streets or along railroad tracks or um, whatever, uh, <laughs> However, they're trying to maintain themselves in cars and not think about what our responsibility is to these human brothers and sisters that we have. And in order for us to make a change, I guess my call of action was to begin to think outside of the land. Why do we have to live within these restrictive laws that say that we can't build something for these folks to live in? our brothers and sisters, who says that it's not our responsibility to feed one another? When did it become such a, a, a place that we are so individualistic that we don't think of community anymore? And if we're going to try to begin to think about building in communities again, we need to start thinking about these folks that are out there living this life right now, and how do we begin to, uh, to be inclusive of folks that need something immediately? Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Karina. Ed, if you want to respond, I um, want to open it up to you. Um, if, if not, then I think this is also a great segue to go into our journaling and visioning um, exercise. So Ed, I want to give you the room and space to do so if needed. I was just going to say briefly that some of us are working nationally to put together a financial cooperative in addition to the work 
that folks are doing around land to build a commons out of the built wealth that is accumulated and, and stored in the form of money. And this financial uh, cooperative, it's called Seed Commons, a community wealth cooperative. Um, and the Southern Reparations Loan Fund is a part of that. I'm the chair of the board of the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, but there are similar groups in Buffalo, New York, Detroit, um, uh, Rich Richmond, California, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, Lexington, Kentucky, Charleston, West, et cetera, we're in several places. Uh, and really, really incredible indigenous uh, uh, immigrant community in, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. So we're trying to build that as a means of, again, opening up opportunities for people to be fully productive which in the final analysis also opens up, including opportunities, people who have been previously incarcerated. It, it, the, the, the prison system is so foul that not only are people who come afoul of it by virtue of the fact that they've had a lack of opportunity in their life, or worse yet, were enjoying some recreational drugs and weren't bothering anybody and just got caught up in that. Um, but when they come out, then they're uh, forbidden for ever having any uh, reasonable employment. And so we're doing a lot of work with what we call returning citizens and, and trying to make sure that, that they are included uh, actively. Uh, and again, as we move to abolish prison and figure out what it is we will have to build to replace it in terms of um, continuing to stand for, for community justice. Uh, but we know that it's not warehousing people in gigantic, um, uh, in gigantic fields behind barbed wire and forcing them to work. So that's, that has to be abolished. And we're looking forward to doing that. And one of the ways of doing it is to build this network of financial institutions that are, again, around creating a financial commons to be available to people in the course of becoming fully productive on the land that should be available through a land commons and, and, and a land trust and such. Thank you. And for folks who want to learn more about land trusts and worker co-ops and the infrastructure that's being built, you can hear from some of the folks that are also part of that uh, deep work um, from Boston Ujima Project in cooperation, Richmond, who joined us for the last webinar. Um, you know, for this next section, I really wanna allude back to what Karina was saying, which is in order for us to go forward, sometimes we need to, to go back to where we were, who we have been. And so as we move into this next three minutes of just taking the time um, that we often don't get to take to stop and, and dream up the world that we want to live in. The question that I want to ask to all of you um, as we move forward in this exercise together is this one. Um, if our people had sovereign land or we're recreating the commons, how does that recreate uh, conditions for safety without violence? What does safety look like in this scenario? How are people's needs getting met? What does abundance look like? What is uh, how do we think about a lack of scarcity, right? So that we that we all get what we need and take care of each other. Um, what are you doing in this world? What are you feeling? What are you tasting? Um, and I also want to ask my team to pull up uh, some art that folks have created in response to our past webinars around this idea of safety, healing, um, having exactly what we need um, as a bit of an inspiration as y'all are thinking about this question that um, Michelle can drop into the chat as you reflect um, and we reflect together. So here's just some of the art. And um, as we're thinking, I, I would love to hear, we would love to hear from folks in the audience. If there's something that comes up for you around what this world feels like, looks like, tastes like when uh, land is sovereign, we're recreate, reconnected to the commons, um, what does safety mean and look like? If you could just uh, raise your hand, which is a feature in the Zoom chat, we would really appreciate it um, and would love to get some thoughts from you all. As Yuki scrolls and we get to see this amazing art created by uh, folks who, yeah, had joined previous calls and were encapsulating some of the themes. Oh, we see some hands. Great. 
can um, Chloe and Yuki, can you make it so that we can listen to some of these folks? Um, Kamal Patel. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, just on the, well, thank you first. Um, glad to be part of this and learn more about Freedom Cities uh, and Just Transition. Um, I, one thing that I'm running up into my work around Just Transition is uh, one, the need for the understanding of materials flows. Um, so understanding the, I think in just transition framework, it talks about um, resources. Um, so how do we close loops um, from like food waste to compost uh, or, you know, biogas or whatever it might be. Um, so talking a little bit more about that stuff. And then I would love to see more uh, discussion around how do we move these things around like food hubs and um, really the distribution piece the actually logistics part of some of these um, realities that uh, just transition and land ownership and food systems would face so it's more of a question and a direction thank you yeah hearing you know, what is this when we close our eyes and envision? How does this play out in practice? How are folks getting the things that they need? And yeah, I encourage you to like answer that question in whatever way um, you need to answer it also um, as we come up with all sorts of answers, knowing that there's not just one system. Um, I think something that transformative justice teaches us is that um, there's as many processes as there are people, as, as Karina mentioned, how do we scale back and go back to the fractal level of our community. Um, so looking forward to digging into that question. Thank you for offering it to us um, and imagining based on that, yeah. Are there other folks who want to share? Um, I see P. Terry had shared a comment in the chat. Would you like to um, speak, speak with us as well today? Hi, um, my name's Terry, and I guess you can't see me, but um, I'm a, a white activist. Um, did a lot of my learning in Portland through Right to Survive, and that's my connection to this group here. And I learned a lot when I went to Standing Rock. And it's like anybody can step up and do um, that security, and it's a part of that really welcoming people and giving and extending trust, and then people perform especially young people. That's it. Thank you. What I'm hearing is giving everyone an entry point to be able to participate in the systems of safety and security that we're creating together. Appreciate that. I see other hands, um, Maria, Patty, Shayana. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing y'all's names correctly. Um, Chloe, do you want to pick on some of these folks? Yeah, I'll just go in the order they're appearing for me. Um, so, um, Maria, do you want to Hey, Maria, you're on mute, but you should be able to share if you unmute yourself. Maybe we'll come back to Maria. Should we should we go to Patty, Chloe? Hey Patty, you're on mute. Yes. No. <laughs> Hello everybody. Um this is my first participation and I'm sorry. I um but I I'm very interested in in following with you guys and getting involved. It's, it seems uh, all the ideas that I have heard, um, that is a really good plan and in terms of safety. I was, um, I was uh, before um, in the safety, 
Okay, I'll meet you where. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's, uh, what I was saying is that um, the model that um, um, freedom to thrive or uh, in last they had uh, about the um, night out, the safety night out, um, mm -hmm. how to do um, community building uh, by offering each of us the best of us so what we can contribute and um, in terms of, of safety on how to face people who are not in peace with themselves and have so much hate that they can um, destroy or be a threat to our communities. I think, um, yes, the answer is getting them involved and, and give them a assurance and value. And, um, and probably uh, it will take a lot for some people to understand their own value and and how can they peacefully navigate with with the, with others because they never had the opportunity to do that. But uh, uh, I think it's important that we all know that the challenge is uh, to be inclusive and 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 show it uh, in action. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Yeah, what I'm hearing is um, an allusion to the National Night Out for Safety and Liberation that is organized by the Ella Baker Center in partnership with uh, Freedom to Thrive, which is an opportunity to practice in real time what it means for us to create uh, communities of care by holding an event where folks can come together and build out a world of, of um, transformative visioning in real time. So what I'm hearing is also how do we flex um, that muscle, not only of imagination, but of practice. Um, and come together uh, when we need to to show each other that we have each other's backs. So appreciate that comment. Um, I think we might need to unfortunately pause. Would love to hear more folks' thoughts um, and uh, want to be respectful of time. So in our last two minutes together, I would love to ask the panelists if they have any closing thoughts, um, any themes that they found to connect this conversation that they want to part to to part ways with. Um, uh, that we can keep thinking about even after this call. So maybe like a sentence or two from each of you, um, and then we will part ways. Karina? Hi, thank you so much. I uh, just wanna um, uh, thank you for bringing uh, folks together to begin to have these conversations. I think I want folks to, um, wherever they live, to work with the indigenous people on whose land they're on, um, to create relationships with folks. If you live in the Bay Area and would like to learn more about Segorite Land Trust, please go to SegorteLandTrust.com um, to learn about the Shell Mounds. Go to Shell Mound at uh, shellmound.org. Um, and if you live in the Bay Area and would like to get involved in other ways and you can't find yourself on the land, we do uh, have on our website Shaumi Tax, and Shaumi in our language means a gift. It's a way of giving back um, to uh, taking care of this land that we all now live on in the Bay Area. It's a way of giving back so that we can begin to um, be the good stewards that we're supposed to be and to be involved in those kinds of ways. Thank you so much, Pearl, and everybody that pulled this together. It was great talking to you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. Uh, and this is Ed again. Thanks for everyone for putting this together. I'm very glad to have had a chance to meet Karina. I'm looking forward to having some additional conversations, as she correctly points out. Um, their, their challenges to the ongoing relationship. Um, you know, part of a national narrative is that except for the indigenous community, we're all immigrants here. And it's real clear to me that I'm a descendant of kidnapped victims and I'm not claiming the, uh, the, the immigration status. My folks didn't come here looking for opportunity. They came trying to avoid getting captured and getting thrown on a ship, but they didn't make, make it. Anyhow, but we're here now and what we have to do while we're here is to build freedom. And it's convincing, I'm convinced that we won't just find it. Uh, it's not gonna fall on us, it's not hiding behind a tree. We have to make it. We're gonna have to use our imaginations, our creativity, our energy to build freedom on this land along with others. 
that uh, no small group of people will do it by themselves. Um, mm -hmm. There have been any number of times when courageous people have tried and not been able to succeed. And we look to the, our success as growing out of uh, a deepening relationship with other people who also have a need to fight against common enemies and build freedom. And that enemy, I think, is the capitalist and racist system that we live under that has engaged in this genocide, uh, the enslavement, the theft, the kidnapping, the murder, um, and has built this country out of it and is often in denial about what its real nature is because there's some people who are highly privileged here. Many of the rest of us are continuing to toil and yet to able to create the freedom that we so much deserve. And I wanted my organizing work to help people understand how and to engage in the practices of building freedom. Thank you both. Thank you all for supporting me in expanding my horizon of what freedom can even mean. Um, I've, I've learned so much just in the process of um, getting to this point of having this conversation and so look forward to all of the hundreds of people who are on this call um, shifting their mindsets and creating change in the way that we do our work together um, in conversation and collaboration towards building freedom. So thank you all so much. A deep, deep, deep honor to be on this call with you. Thanks, Pearl. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the folks taking notes, to the folks doing tech, um, for all the folks who have uh, put in work to make this happen. Appreciate all of you. I love you all. Goodbye. Thank you, Ed. Bye-bye. Thank you, Karina.